All right, we have Katie Murphy here. She is a higher ed reporter for the Oakland Tribune and the, Bay, the entire Bay Area News Group. Uh -huh. We'd like you to talk about that. Thank you for coming. Um, but is that your official title? Then you do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I used to do, um, for years, I covered K-12 education, mostly Oakland schools, and then for maybe six years. Um, and then about three months ago, I um, became what we call a regional right reporter for and covering higher ed um, for the whole, so the Mercury News and the Tribune and the Contra Costa Times. So there you go. Here, stand over here so that thing yeah. is in your eyes. And I'll turn over you. Tell tell us about your career, the whole thing. What we'll okay. let you go, and then we're gonna start asking you questions and everything. Yeah. So we'll, thank you for coming. Oh, well, thanks so much for having me. Um, there you go. Now it's not. Yeah. Good. Yes. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm not blinded. Um, and if you need me to get someone on the computer, just let me know. And okay. Yeah. So I um, I've been a reporter for ten years now, and. Um, I didn't start out, I majored in anthropology in school, <laughs> um, but I worked for the, um, I interned at my college, like the local newspaper in the town where I went to school, and um, didn't have any experience. I was completely green, so they, they put me on the featurey lifestyle section, and I wrote about couples that took trips and, you know, really fluffy things. And I loved it anyway, so I figured if I have, you know, this is like the fluffiest possible material and I'm still loving talking to people and, and writing, then, then maybe this is what I should get into. Um, but I didn't right away go into journalism after college. I went to um, Puerto Rico for two years and I did a volunteer project, um, tutor, like teaching, and I was a community organizer. Um, I still was unsure what I wanted to do, but then I um, decided that I really missed writing while I was there. And so um, I did a fellowship at the Pointer Institute in Florida, and it was a six-week crash course in journalism. And um, very long days, <laughs> um, really it was a great experience. Um, and I learned everything, well, like almost everything that I had known up until that point about journalism. Um, and so I got my, um, I got my first job. Um, my husband, or he was my boyfriend at the time, was um, going to grad school at Indiana University and there happened to be a job opening, the night cops reporter. Um, I had never covered a breaking news story in my life. Um, just kind of got thrown into this and um, luckily there were some very good copy editors there to make sure <laughs> we d I mean, there are a lot of things that could really get you in trouble um, if you report that you're not uh, supposed to. So I learned how to do that. Um, then I went into covering um, court cases, trials, criminal justice issues. There was a lot of overcrowding at the jail. Um, there were disparities in, in bond and you know bail amounts that were being set. I wrote about that sort of thing. Um, oh, I didn't introduce myself. Or <laughs> it's Katie. My name's Katie Murphy. Um, and then um, eight years ago, we moved to California, and the job that was open was education reporting for the Daily Review in Hayward. So I started out there, and then um, moved to the Oakland Tribune a, a year and a half later. Um, and I think that I, I consider myself really lucky um, that I get to do what I do because um, it's never boring. Every day is different. Um, I get to be nosy and ask people all kinds of questions. I get to write, which I've always loved to do. That's kind of what got me into this to begin with, was writing because um, I was thinking of like how could I write and eat at the same time um, and I, I love just like getting out I, I don't like being stuck in an office so I whenever possible now that I'm covering higher ed I try to spend a day at least one day every week working on a college campus and so um, the other day I filed a story from the cafeteria at San Jose State and um, it was just so it's just really exciting for me to kind of um, be 
in the mix and you know, kind of see the people that I'm writing about and not just be off in some newsroom somewhere. Um, so I, I love doing that. Um, I'm still, I have a lot to learn about higher education issues. Um, so I'm writing about community colleges, universities, public and private. Um, so there's a lot to learn. Um, and I'm just in my third or fourth month doing this. Um, and, but I really love it. And um, I know you guys are learning about social media. Uh, when I first started reporting, our newspaper had a website, but it was kind of an afterthought. Like we would write the story, but it would just be, you know, deadline at 5.30. And then there was a website and we knew it went on there. And that was it. That we didn't do anything special for it. It was just, you know. Um, then a few years later, they started talking about, oh, we need to do little updates when people start to go online at, at 4 p.m. and you know 11 a.m. and then um, that was a really radical concept for us. And then um, now, then when I when I started at the Trib um, covering Oakland schools, about six months into the beat. I realized there was so much going on that I could not get to. People were calling me with these great stories. Things were like falling out of the sky that I, that I couldn't get to. So I started a blog, and um, that was in 2007. And it was funny because I, people used it. And it's still, I'm no longer doing it because I switch beats, but it's still sort of continuing. And um, it, was a, it was just incredible. Like the, interaction that I could have with readers. Like suddenly I became a human being, you know? I wasn't just this reporter, I wasn't just a byline, it was like I was a human. And they would ask me questions. And so I, it's, I would go out and people would know me, not from my byline, from my stories, but from the blog. That, that's what they, they kind of felt like, a, they felt a connection and they felt almost like ownership over this. Because they could participate and um, they would debate amongst each other. It, was this, it just became a forum to debate different um, issues. And there's a lot of controversy and a lot of disagreement um, in the system. What's the name of it? Oh, it has a really boring name. But um, it's, I, I can type okay. it in. Um, but it was so fun. It, sometimes it drove me crazy because you know I never could take a break. You know. Um, <laughs> But, oh, can I just, I don't know why it's showing up like this. Did they change it around? This looks like it's a different kind of format. Oh. Hmm. Well, here we go. Okay. So this, so some of my colleagues are keeping it up now. Um, has still has my name on it. <laughs> but. Um, you know, because Tony Smith, the superintendent, just resigned. Yeah. Um, but it was a great, it was really eye-opening for me because I saw how much people, I learned so much from them as a reporter because here are people who are in the schools, sent, their kids are in the schools or they're teaching, so they knew collectively so much more than I did. And so I really could draw on their insights in, tips and, and wisdom, and um, they could share information with each other. And um, so that was, that was kind of, you know, that, that went on for a long time. And then um, now I'm also on Twitter, ibabuzz.com slash education. And then a few years ago, I joined Twitter, not really knowing what it was. <laughs> But, you know, it's, it's a great way to, um, like, well, I use it to find out information, like, to, I create all these different lists, and I have a list for higher ed, and, um, you know, like a list for breaking news. Um, so when I have to fill in on the breaking news shifts for the paper, I know that I'm not missing anything because I'm following all the local TV stations, KCBS, every reporter that I know of is in a list and I make sure I monitor that constantly. So it's good for me from a breaking news standpoint, also for higher education, it's great for me to follow. Also to try to get my stories out there 
because there's a lot of people don't go to our website and most of our traffic doesn't come from people going to our website and going, hmm, I wonder what they have. It's like they find out, our, they discover our stories by people emailing them links or by through Twitter or Facebook, people you know, coming across these things during searches for a, on a specific issue, not going to our website and searching on there. So it's really important to, um, if you want to have your stories read, and, and nowadays, um, like when I first started, there was no way to know how many people read my story about this court case. Mm -hmm. You just, we knew how many people were subscribing to the newspaper, but nobody could really tell. And now I get a report every day telling me how many people clicked on my story from the last day, which is a little terrifying. Um, yeah. and, well, and there's different, you know, they could, my stories appear on different sites, so it's, it's not, it's not, it's a little messy sometimes actually pinpointing a number, but that's the reality today is that, you know, revenue is generated by per click. And so there's a lot of um, pressure to have your stories disseminated as wi widely as possible so that we get more clicks. And so, you know, advertisers pay more and we stay afloat. And uh, <laughs> so um, that's, that's definitely new. And that's um, been even a change in the last like, couple of years. Um, there's Facebook too. Um, sometimes I'm not the best at uh, keeping my Facebook, um, you know, I have a work Facebook and a personal Facebook. Um, and, but yeah, so that, that those are all things. And then also um, multimedia. I don't know how many guys, how many of you um, are doing video, do video or video editing or audio editing, you do? Um, that's really important. and. I'm, um, I really enjoy it. I don't do enough of it, um, but I taught myself how to edit with Final Cut Pro, and, um, and so it's really fun, and especially when I was covering the schools, it's like great to have video of kids doing interesting things, and um, so video you is, that? huh? Where do you post that? And so the videos would go, they would get embedded on, like along with the article. Usually I'd write an article to, like if I was writing about summer school and or you know summer programs, um, then I'd have an article and then there would be a video in there. Um, and so and now it's really easy to, I mean, to take like before when I was first doing it, you had to get use a separate video camera and then it was flash. It was like took forever to do anything, and now you can just take video with your phone, as you guys all probably know. And, and there's editing software. There's iMovie that's free on your phone. You can edit um, and just do quicker things that way. Um, so that's really important. Um, and there are just countless. We have all these trainings. It seems like every month, telling us about other things that we could be trying out and doing. And it's hard to keep track of them all. I mean, they all sound really interesting. Storify. Oh, I, I could show you that. Um, I did a store, like, so I'm no, I know I'm no longer on the Oakland Schools Beat, but I couldn't resist helping out. Um, and so I made a Storify page. Do you guys know what that is? Do you learn about it? So Storify um, lets you. <laughs> it's, uh, and we, we use our own URL for it, but this is the format. So, S T O R I F Y. So, you take it's so easy. It like I was thinking it was gonna be complicated, and you it's very intuitive. Um, you just set up an account, it's free, and then it lets you um, go like here. You, get, you can go and search for things mostly on Twitter, because on Twitter, everything anybody posts is public. You can use it, um, as opposed to Facebook, which has a lot of privacy settings. On Twitter, if you search for Tony Smith or OUSD, then all these things pop up, and then you, can, you drag them into your storyline in any order, and you can write little notes. So of course, I had to lead with our own story, um, and then I, then I link to a story that I had done um, you know, right when he was hired, so people could look back and see that. Um, a couple blog posts. And then 
you know, profiles of him that we had done. And then here's some tweets. People I don't even know, but they, I searched for his name. These came up. Um, Oakland OUSD leader Tony Smith resigned. Who will lead the beast? <laughs> that was a good one. Um, and of course, you know, people started talking about school closures because he closed schools, or you know, he supported school closures, recommended them. And so some people were talking about, because he's moving to Chicago, which also is closing schools. So here are my notes. You add in your own notes. You can kind of like explain. Um, and you know, the word now, the popular word is curate, like you're curating, which is really high-minded for what this is. <laughs> but um, <laughs> anyway, so you just pull in what's interesting to you. Um, and and just kind of create a story, see what people are saying. And it's really easy, and it's kind of fun, I think. And then, um, of course, yeah, then you can, um, th it's built into Storify where um, you publish it, and then it notifies all the people, all the people that you quoted from their tweets. Like all the people whose tweets you dragged into the thing, it will send them a message saying, you're quoted. So then maybe they'll retweet it you know, and more people will see it. You'll get more clicks, more money. <laughs> so you get an audience immediately. Yeah. And a distribution channel. Yes. It just goes out. That's and it's really low. It's like, it, take, it took me like 10 minutes or 15 minutes to do this. Because it's other people's tweets and your own, maybe your own story or your own blog. Um, so it helps. Th this works when there's something like a, hot topic that everybody's talking about. And it could be a national news thing. It could be something local. There just has to be enough people talking about it online. And then um, you can search by Twitter for whatever. And then there's a Facebook icon. But I usually don't have as much luck with Facebook because people have um, wisened up and put everything on yeah, private. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Or you can also use any link. Like I linked to this blog post that um, our intern did. So you can drag those in. Um, and so it's, it's fun, it's easy, and that's just an example of something else that we're doing. And then um, there's also the live chat. Have you guys done live chats or participated in any yeah. ever? Well, I've just been asked, even though I wasn't reporting um, this story, there was a tragedy in the South Bay involving a high school girl who was um, sexually assaulted, and then, yeah. Um, so she, um, yeah, she killed herself. And um, last fall, and then they just arrested three boys. Um, and so there, we're going to have a chat on Monday with um, with some psychologists and people who are expert who give advice to parents on what to do and how to, you know monitor their children's um, you know, social media use or how to talk to them about it. And so um, I've been asked to moderate this. So basically, just ask the questions of these, you know, these people. And then you know, we get people's you know, audience, people, you know, audience members at, write in with their questions too. So, it's, so the job has gotten a lot. There's a lot more going on. <laughs> I used to have the whole day, and I could just spend it you know reporting and writing and now it's like well first you got to get an early version up a few graphs it, they always say ask give me a few graphs like you know right away and then you just keep adding to it um, so that because you want your link up first um, so that it gets it's high up when somebody googles it so you want your story to get out there really quickly and then you can always add to it later but there's so there's a million things that you have to do all day and you're juggling them. But it kind of makes it fun. So most of the time, it's fun. <laughs> um, and people might write in with feedback and stuff that you didn't think about. And then you can maybe add that to the story um, before it goes into print. So. Um, well, can, can I ask a couple of questions? Yeah. And then we'll open it up. Of so tell us a little bit about how your job has changed since you first started to 
doing stuff like that. And that's a big, that's a big change. Yeah, right? so, it is. So what, what, what are some of the biggest yeah. changes? What are some of the biggest changes for you in your, in your everyday workflow? Mm -hmm. um, well, for one thing, um, you know, as I mentioned, the, the story, it's not just one story that you turn in at the end of the day. It's, there's, you have to just get something up and you've got to write really quickly um, to just have something, um, like an early version, and that's new, having multiple versions mm -hmm. of stories. Um, tweeting and having to kind of promote your own work is different, like, because there used to be none of that at all. We would just write, and also there's much more interaction between me and readers. Um, one funny thing that happened is, so, I um, was covering, I used to cover all the Oakland school board meetings, and um, people would follow me, like people started follow, knowing that I was tweeting from the meeting. So before, oh, this is a classic example. I used to go and cover school board meetings in Hayward and San Leandro and just sit there with my notebook, no equipment, and I would write it down, and there was no internet connection even in the room. So I would have to race back to the newsroom to write a story, or I'd have to dictate it, call it in. Now I'm at a school board meeting or a board of regents meeting or whatever, and I'm tweeting, blogging, and um, also writing notes because I have to write a story if there's something big happening. And occasionally I've done a live blog where I'll just continually update the blog with like new things that are happening. If there's a long dramatic hearing about something that people care about, which is rare, but you know, like a school closure or something like that. Um, so what happened was I was sitting there already juggling like 50 things and the people next to me are reading over my shoulder, you know. One person pointed out a spelling mistake. <laughs> um, so it is very, participatory <laughs> and I'm just sitting there in this like hot room like trying to you know write my story and then um, suddenly I get Twitter bombed has anybody gotten Twitter bombed before like all these people is. all these people knew who I was they knew I was at the meeting and they said you know at Katie Murphy why aren't you reporting about this thing because this there was public comment and people were all raising this major issue relating to special education and I thought, wow, this is huge. I haven't heard of anything like this before. And immediately put everything on hold and, and started emailing the public relations person for the district to see what the story was. Because I can't just, I can tweet, sort of. I could tweet what they're saying, but it's much better to, they're saying all these numbers, and I want to verify them first. So, and we still have standards, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and so it takes a while. It's not just instantaneous, and I don't know everything, you know? I mean, and so people started saying, why aren't you reporting this? Why aren't you reporting this? And so it was like they were wanting me to tweet. They knew I was there, and they were, dem they were specifically demanding that I report this really important issue, which was really kind of interesting. And then one time I left a meeting a little bit early, mm -hmm. and somebody tweeted, did you just leave? <laughs> so, I had heard that one before. Yeah, so basically, yeah, there was just like total transparency. My whole process is out there. If I leave a meeting early, you know, I didn't respond to it actually that one. But, um, so it does seem, it was, and it's kind of exciting for a reporter because we want people to care about what we write about. And so when they do, even if they're pressuring us to write about something, we know that they care and that there's interest and there's value in what we're doing. So it's funny, it can be frustrating, but it's also um, can be validating because you don't want to just write things and then hear nothing back. And before it just used to be, the only way I used to hear back from people before was um, phone calls and in emails, but now it's you know different ways of, and I still get a lot of emails, fewer phone calls. Um, but, which is fine. Yeah. So, I don't mark that, but before we open up, yeah. so the other thing I want to ask is, so when you first, when you started down in um, Hayward, 
Uh-huh. And then you moved to the Oakland Tribune before really the Bay Area News grew, grew to what it is now. Uh-huh. How has that change been? And, and if you don't don't say, don't give away any corporate secrets or anything. But I mean, <laughs> for, for a reporter, I mean, how is that? Because now you're not just reporting for one newspaper, you're reporting for, uh, well, potentially it's quite a few now. Many, yeah. yeah. And, and that is a, that's a change. Isn't that's it? a big change. Yeah. Um, and so when I first started at the Tribune, um, it was, uh, well, I can't remember what version it was. It went from ANG to right. Bang, um, and then we've we've our newsrooms have mer merged a couple years ago fully with the Mercury News um, newsroom. So our editors, we we actually sometimes report like before we were very separate. We might share some content, but we didn't ever report to the editors down there. Um, now, especially, so then um, my job, even just when I was still covering Oakland schools, um, more and more it, I was asked to make things appeal to, okay, so yes, there's an issue in Oakland, but how could I broaden it and make this also be relevant to somebody living in Livermore or, you know, because a lot of these issues are very common throughout the school system. So. Um, Whenever I wrote anything, I had to keep in mind the readership and the regional readership because we want the stories to also get in as many papers as possible because we all want to be as widely read as possible. And now my job, I'm going all over the place. So there's, um, it means that there's less room for local stories that are very local. And, um, you know, so we're really, more um, looking for stories that are really big picture things. And they could tie into a specific local example, but they, they have to be bigger picture or else um, it's probably not gonna fly. Or maybe it will if it's a really good story. <laughs> um, so it's definitely made me think bigger um, and more like regionally or statewide in scope, but you have to, it's like a balance because we also want to have local voices and local angles. And so I have to get, you know, somebody from Oakland, somebody from San Jose, somebody from, you know, Orinda or, you know, so it's, it seems like um, it is. So that's kind of our challenge because um, we're trying to appeal to everybody because there's fewer of us. So we have one, you know, I'm the only higher person covering colleges for the whole chain. So um, whatever I write has to be something that every paper w would want to pick up, for the most part. Uh, you guys have questions? Uh-huh. I did. Um, when you were at the school board meeting and you got Twitter bombed, uh -huh. were they in the room or were they watching the educational TV or what? I think some. What were they doing? I wasn't sure. I think some of the people were there, but <laughs> not everyone. I think some of, a couple of the people, <laughs> Um, a couple of the people knew that this was going on. They knew that, that a group of teachers had planned to speak out on uh, this. So they were supporting their friends or colleagues? Uh-huh. Oh, okay. And they were probably trying to see what was going on. And then I wasn't telling them. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And it was good. I mean, um, but I did want to know, because some of the numbers, that it seemed like they seemed so extreme that I wanted to know, and I hadn't heard about it before, and usually I'd heard, would hear some rumblings. So I didn't want to just induce a panic without verifying And did the, the numbers turn out to be fairly accurate? They were. Uh, so it really was like a big story. It was a big story. Right yeah, up. they weren't totally accurate, but it was, yeah. It was and and it, the news had just come out, and everybody was blindsided by it, and um, including, I think, I mean, a lot of people that should have known about this before, um, and it had to do with budget, you know, a budget shortfall. Um, so it was, you know, so I got on the story <laughs> right away. Um, but yeah, it was a good. Uh -huh. Oh, um, this is not so much a social media uh, kind of question, but it's fascinating that you, you work uh, as a reporter for Open Unified and uh, Poppy Hayward, and so you've seen the dysfunction in these in the school districts and the challenges. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, now you're in higher education and you can see like, mm -hmm. the gaps between, you know, uh, uh, first to 12, went on to college. Mm -hmm. And obviously it's, it's a big issue, especially in the East Bay, concerning like, you know, lack of representation of, of, of youth of color in college mm -hmm. and the problems, you know, high dropout rates. You know, what have you learned or what's your experience of, of having seen this system, like the whole system, and what's working and what's not working? Yeah, well, that's, that's, I mean, I, I feel like that's the question. I mean, that's like a, a big part of what I need to be writing about and exploring. Um, I think that I, you know, what I have written about, like this week, um, I learned about the rate of, you know, <clears throat> the community colleges put out a scorecard, and I reported on that, that showed of all the people who show up to college and want and exp you know they're not just there to take a little class here or there, but they either they want to transfer or they want to get a certificate or um, degree AA degree. What percentage of them of each college by race by age meet, succeed within six years? And I was kind of surprised to see how low the percentage was um, in you know in some places, but it breaks it down by college and. Um, I think that's kind of a, that might be a, a good starting point. And the other thing was with that, that you looked at, they broke it down by how many students enter prepared versus unprepared. And the, the difference there, I mean, it should be no surprise, but that people who, I mean, a great number um, who enter, or very, I guess very few people who start at a college have, like, are just taking college level work from the beginning. And I think that goes to your point about the preparation that they have going, you know, leading up to that point. So um, I think, is it like 75% or something um, of students end up taking at least a remedial course in math or English? And then those success rates are way um, lower than, as you might expect, than people who enter prepared. And it breaks it down for you, which I've never seen that data. So I think in my reporting, I think that's a good place to start to, you know, to look and then figure out what is happening and, and what, are the, like, what are the gaps? Are there specific areas in particular that are really holding people back? Or is it you know, that they're, maybe it's that they, they graduated from high school 20 years ago and are coming back now. And, you know, there, I think we have a perception that people are just, it's all like, you know, they just didn't learn anything in high school and went straight to college. But like a lot of people just forgot probably because they're changing careers and now they have to catch back up with, I can't even imagine like taking a math class right now. <laughs> um, but, you know, so I think it's so complicated, but it's definitely a good, um, covering K-12 and now doing this gives me a good, Perspective and like grounding in you know. Well, do you have opinions? Do you have views about this stuff? Well, I don't really have. I, I don't really feel as a reporter. I don't really feel comfortable giving my opinion um, on a lot of things, especially broadly, especially when I'm getting taped. But I mean, but, but well, I mean, a couple I mean, of things on that. I mean, yeah. that isn't really your job because they right. have an opinion page. Right. Opinion. Okay. Yeah, there's yeah, people there's who write, col you know, columnists that, um, sometimes I wish, sometimes I think about the day that I leave reporting <laughs> yeah. and I can just, you know, yeah, <laughs> cut loose and give, tell you exactly what I think about everything. Um, but for now, I have to restrain myself. You, were, you worked <laughs> in the editorial department, though, didn't you? Mm -mm. Oh, you have? Mm -mm. Yeah, yeah, but that story on the community college thing was a, a good example of broadening it out from Barry because you covered Merritt and DeAnza, right? Yeah, and San Jose, San Jose City College. Right, so you had a broad, so that was a, a mm -hmm. good example. That's of a perfect should. story for mm -hmm. regionalization, as right. we call it, because you can pull up data from everywhere, you know. And then we had a graphic, oh, that's the other thing. We do graphics, that's the other thing reporters do, is figure out how to, you know, we gather, we figure out what the graphic maybe should be, and then talk with the art department and give them the information and then, you know, work with them. 
You know, I, I don't know. If, I don't know if this is an opinion question or not, but I was just wondering. I, I was really shocked to hear about uh, Smith resigning, and I was wondering if you thought there was more to that story than, um, at, you know, like maybe something to do with the AIM thing, or maybe mm -hmm. something to do with the fact that you know he made so many enemies by closing those schools. It could be, and I think there's this actually. I think there's a story coming out on that very subject. Oh, so stay tuned for more. Stay tuned. Yeah, I love that. And it's like, it was kind of killing me that I wasn't there on the beat to explore wow, this. And yeah. yeah. But um, I, there is something coming out right. on that. Yeah. So. Looking forward Not going to. No spoilers. Yeah, no spoilers. So um, I'm a multimedia major, so I want to congratulate you on teaching yourself Final Cut Pro. Oh. Because <laughs> that was the first thing I was going to ask. Is, are you software savvy? What you know? What are you using to, to edit, or what are you using in your day of work? But my real question is, is: What is your passion in writing? Like, what are you really passionate about in this field that you're in? Like, because I've kind um, of heard you work different places, but I'm yeah. still trying to figure out what your. I guess I'm. I love telling stories, okay. so I'm not really particular. I love. Um, I mean, I. What, in my old job, one of my favorite things to do was talk to kids, especially like fifth graders or a riot. Um, <laughs> but any any age group, they were. It was just fun to talk to students, and he, and I still now really am interested in like the students' perspective of things. Or um, so it's really like my passion is more about um, getting like telling a story that people might not already know and, and, and getting people to think about different issues and, and to inform people about things. Um, and so it's not like one specific thing, but um, that's a good question. I think that it's just, I, as long as it's interesting, I, like I, yeah, I, I guess storytelling is the best way to put that. Oh, um, I didn't. I don't know if you said it or I just didn't jot it down. You said there was one point in your job that they started asking you to update the website at 4, at 11, so they started noticing people were mm -hmm. starting to use the internet more. What year? Let's what see, year? that would have been... Oh, gosh. I think you said it was before your blog. That, that, was, that was when I was actually still in Indiana. So I think that was in 2003 or 4. Mm -hmm. um, let's go all the I was gonna ask, what do you what do you think about um, people who um, not not so per se just bloggers, but people who report news from from their their computer at their home instead of in the profession that you are in. Right? Mm -hmm. So basically, that that's not their job, but they like it so much that they do it on their free time, and they have a lot of views or a lot of critics or a lot of mm -hmm. uh, like people who blog are mm -hmm. not not even blog like like say. Um, Get on YouTube and they post a, a something like a, a like it could be like your own news news station. So like citizen journalists. Yes. Yeah, citizen yeah. Journalists. I think it's great. I think it's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, I and I think. Did you do a story on that? Well, it's not really higher ed. Except that she does a story on this class, but we're not going to pitch her. <laughs> but I think I would. Nice try though. It would. <laughs> I guess I I think that um, it depends on what. Because citizen journalism isn't entirely new, um, so that wouldn't be a news story. But if the citizen journalist was saying something in particular yeah. that was really relevant to the news of the day or something, um, then definitely. Could you like take this their story though, since they're not in that profession or whatever, and they post that on Facebook or whatever? It or depends. Um, you know, we're very. We can't just li you can't just like lift content. Um, especially photos and images. With YouTube, I think that's public. Yeah. Um, and you can take that um, and embed it. But I think you'd be really, we'd be careful to ask permission and, yeah. you know, cite, give credit to the person. Because um, there's definitely licensing issues and stuff like that. But I, I do think it's really great. Um, and a lot of times I'm always curious to know, okay, where is this person coming from? You know, before I would take information that they said and use it, I would want to know who they are, you know, where they got their information from, because sometimes people put things out 
that are true and sometimes not quite so reliable, you know, really? so, huh? Really? Yeah, imagine that. <laughs> okay, over here. Um, I, I was curious what um, post or article of yours uh, has, has got the most clicks and what elements uh, contributed to that. Hmm, that's Your a good question. Uh, oh, I know, I could tell you. But this is kind of like a little, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know if disheartening is the word. Because the thing that, that, that kind of catch 22 here is that right now what we're finding is like the stories that we consider important, serious journalism, like sometimes they get way, like if you look at the things that get the most hits, it's like a news, it's like a car fire or a dog that something happened to this dog or, you know, like, I mean, sometimes it's like huge important stories, but often it's crime yeah. that gets the most hits. Um, and so, or things that are, we don't consider, it's not, for some of us, not why we got into reporting to begin with. Um, so, but one story that went crazy was this little story that I did about the UC logo changing. Oh, yeah. And I think I wrote about it first um, because no, I was searching for it on Twitter. I couldn't find anything, but somebody had sent, somebody sent it to me. So it's not, I can't take credit for discovering it, but my editor found something, a blog about it, um, internal UC blog. I wrote about it and we had the images, the old and the new. And I think that's what, so even though it wasn't totally replacing it, it was, you know, people went crazy. And I mean, within, I mean, I, I've never had so many hits, I don't think, on a story. And it took me no time to write. I mean, and it was a fun, like, lighthearted story. But then it got picked up by, you know, or other, you know, the LA Times was writing about it. Like, you know, not, they didn't give me sight my story or anything, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, it was going crazy on Twitter. And so I think that people. And it got pretty serious. Yeah, then they took back, they changed their mind. They took the logo back. Um, so, <laughs> but I mean, it, this was a UC wide thing. And, and so it's just an example of something that you never know what's going to like touch a nerve with people. And I think people, everybody who'd gone there was sharing it probably on their social networks. And it would be interesting to look more deeply into what happened and how those it was one of my first stories, so my editors were very impressed. That was good. Uh, <laughs> case study, I'm like, how can I do that again? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, though, do you think it would have blown up if you didn't make your, that post? The tweet, like yeah, tweeted out. Yeah. About it? And I, no, I don't know because I think that's what set it off. But maybe somebody else would have down the line discovered it. But we posted it, and then it was just then other people started. So. And it had been out for a while, so that's why I think we started it. Um, but I definitely think the images were key. And so that's the other thing that we're always trying to do is get images with our stories, um, no matter what. Because people will click on things if they see a picture. Like on Facebook, too, they're much less likely to click on a link if it's just text. But if you have a photo, anything, you know. And that's what I would try to do on my blog, too. I just think, yeah. With, you said with pictures, but also is there strategies for like your headlines? Oh, yes. We, it's called, well, have you guys learned about search engine optimization, SEO? Yeah, we talked about it a little bit. That's yeah. a big thing, too, and we're still learning. I'm still learning um, how to do this. But some, I didn't even write the headline, but somebody wrote some catchy headline. And I think that, that headlines have a lot to do with how how much people are going to read your story. But you don't write your headlines. They but have, now, are, I do. Well, actually, that? the thing is, we used oh. to never, reporters never used to write headlines, and we still don't write them for print. Yeah. Because you never know, like, I don't know where in the, how much space is there's going to be for the mm -hmm. headline or where it's going to end up in the paper. But for online, we do. Sometimes they get changed. But for the web, we'll sometimes write them, and sometimes they'll get rewritten. But um, there's, they, we have trainings on, how to, like you don't want to use acronym, like you want to use things that people will search for when they're doing a Google search and that are catchy, but not, um, like it has to be something that even if you're not in the know, like it, it can't be too insider-ish. 
you know, so somebody will be like, what, who's that? You know, if you're going to use a name, it has to be somebody really famous, you know. Um, so, yeah, good question. Yeah. There are so many um, higher ed systems. Is it, is it hard to, like, keep a sort of continuity with reporting on all the different, the different le levels? There's, like, the, the state system, and there's the UC system, and then I know our own community college system is its own system, separate from other systems. Is it like? Then there's private colleges. Yeah, and there's and there's, there's so for many. Profit, <laughs> yeah. Online so, providers. MOOCs. MOOCs. Yeah, I've been writing a lot about MOOCs. MOOCs. So does Massive. it is it difficult to try and write about them all as if they're one system? Or is that, well, is I that like the that's a good modus operandi there? That's going to be my big challenge is, is um, balancing that. And I, I definitely write about them like they're, I guess in one sense or it's public higher ed in California. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that sense, it's all like people who are invested in that mission. Um, they all are linked together in some way. Like in that sense, I write about it as one. But then also, I'll often write about one system or the other, okay. or the other. <laughs> um, but the challenge is that I won't be able to be, because of the number of colleges that I'm covering, I, I can't cover them at the level that somebody might have before when they were just really responsible for East Bay colleges or you know Oakland, yeah, mostly East Bay before. Um, so. You know, unless I know something's going on, I, I can't get, you know, when I was covering Oakland schools, I was at every board meeting. So, you know, now it's a different level of information that, or, you know, stories that I can get to. And it's, I'm going to need tips from people. <laughs> I'm going to need people like you um, to email me and let me know when things are going on. Um, and, you know, because I, I won't always be there going through all of the agendas, of, it'll be impossible. But think regionally. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so Katie, I wanted to know, um, how, when and how are you using Final Cut Pro? And mm -hmm. are you aware that there is now like talk of Adobe Premiere and Avid coming in also? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Well, I, you, the thing is, as with a lot of news organizations, we don't have all that much money. So yeah. some of the stuff I've invested in, like myself, um, so I bought it when it when the Final Cut Pro 10 came out. Yeah. That's when I got it because it was cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I um, and then I started going to the Apple Store because I got the you know for a certain amount you could get one-on-one -on -one tutoring mm -hmm. and their products. So that that's kind of how like I I went through and taught some things to myself and then I would go in and bring work. So I would um, you know so I would. Basically, if there was something very visual happening for one of my stories, and I had time, and it wasn't a daily story, um, then I would, um, you know, use my video camera and then, um, then create. Like I do really short things, like two, two minutes mostly, um, two to three minutes. And that's a new trend where reporters are yeah. asked to do that kind of stuff. Yeah. Right? yeah, and then I did like a little something experimenting, but not with Final Cut, just with my phone. Or like there was like the first day of school story, and it was at a school that absorbed all these other kids from other schools that had gotten closed, mm -hmm. and so it doubled in size. So I was there, and and then I did a voiceover, but that was all yeah. through my first voiceover, um, which was a little terrifying, but it was fun to like take risks. But you know we're not used to having our voice coming out, you know, in the story. Um, but that was all with iMovie on my phone, the free app. And um, so it wasn't as nice of a video, um, but and then I use photos. I use still photos for Final Cut often, with that were taken by our photographers, which definitely makes the final product look a lot more polished, um, you know, because they're actual real photos, and as opposed to my shaky video. And Ray Chavez, who you know, uh -huh. is talking next week to us. Oh, oh my gosh, yeah. Ray is He's amazing. Great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do you anything you want to end on or any? Final thoughts? Well, I don't know if I have any final thoughts. Okay, other than, well, we'll. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I love, I love this job, and it's um, it's really, it's it's kind of a, an exciting time in a way, 
um, to be in, everybody goes, oh, you're in like, you're in the newspaper, how is the newspaper business, you know, <laughs> at parties, and, and, I, and I try to focus on the positive, because I, you know, it, it is, it can be, it's sort of a scary time, but it's also like, so much is happening, and anything could happen, we don't know what direction things are going to go in, and um, so it's kind of, yeah, it, it does seem like um, it's an exciting time, too. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Don't give up. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who am I, for starters? Uh, yeah, I'm Kip Welch. I work for an organization in Silicon Valley called Motion Picture Laboratories, uh, short for Movie Labs. Our URL is movielabs.com. We work for the movie industry. We do technology research around digital distribution, internet di distribution, content protection, sort of piracy research, a lot of things around protecting movie and television content and distributing movie and television content online, essentially. We, we're mostly a, a, a group of scientists. I'm like the only business and legal person because every Hollywood organization has to have a lawyer, so I'm, I'm that person. Um, but, uh, you know. Um, and we, you know, we do lots of, lot, lots of, I don't know, I find it an interesting thing to work on. I've been doing it for about seven years. I uh, have been a technology lawyer in the Bay Area for 22 years was a uh, general counsel of a computer game company in the, in the 90s, then spent seven years in the in-house legal department at Intel, and now have been working for the kind of technology part of the movie industry for the last seven years. Now, I'll tell you right up front, I don't know any stars. I never meet any famous people. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just work kind of the back office, boring part of the movie industry. I uh, know a little bit about you know the legal parts around copyright, but Unfortunately, never get to meet any stars. Though I was, I'll tell you one story real quick. I was on a phone call the other day uh, with a bunch of supply chain people at Walt Disney Corporation, and suddenly there's this voice in the background, and everyone goes, who's that, who's that? I, was on, like, I wasn't in the room, and it sounded like Tom Hanks. And they were filming something on the lot, I think it was uh, the movie about Walt Disney, and he was playing Walt Disney. And Tom Hanks can go anywhere he wants, because he's Tom Hanks. So he just walked into this room full of people having a meeting, you know, and, they, and started talking to them and spent like 10 minutes talking to them. I was on the phone, I didn't get to meet him at all, but he was like, it was really cool. I mean, he just sort of walked in and said, oh, you guys are the ones who do all, all the work in the movie business. Great, I'm happy to, happy to meet you, you know, and then he, then he walked off. So that's about the closest I ever get to actual <laughs> movie stars. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so anyway, um, what I thought just as a general matter that we could talk about today is I know you want to talk about copyright law, inter internet law, fair use, things like that. Uh, I wanted to just say a little bit about some topics that I know a lot about and because it's sort of the day-to-day -day work that we do at Movie Labs. Um, and then kind of a little bit about some things that you know, you've probably all heard about that are kind of scary about copyright law, people getting sued and stuff. And then try to communicate to some extent just the common sense approach. Um, I'm one of those lawyers that thinks that we've over-lawyered most of what we do in this country. We waste more time than you can imagine in court arguing about things, you know, stuff that just really doesn't matter very much in the real world. So I want to at least try to bring some practical sense to, you know, if you're going to be journalist, what's, what's really going to matter versus what are all the things that could potentially happen. So that's really all I had in mind for today. And then questions, jump in with them whenever you want. Um, oh, we've been through this, I'm just telling who I am. Um, so I just wanted to talk about something I know a lot about, if you ever wanted to ask about. So um, YouTube, right? This class is about social media. In the movie and TV industry, the biggest impact that social media has had over the last five, six, seven years has probably been around user-generated content on sites like YouTube. I mean, there have been hundreds of sites over the years. YouTube is kind of the big gorilla in the space, but my, the people I work with most directly at Hollywood Studios and television networks, they freak out, and they did freak out about suddenly everyone posting clips of their movies and whole versions of their movies. All this stuff suddenly appeared online 
that they thought they owned and had control of. And it totally freaked them out, right? And it made them start to reevaluate everything that were, they were doing in their business. Because if people didn't want to pay for their movie, well, they could probably find it for free somewhere out there. Uh, if you didn't watch Saturday Night Live and watch the commercials, you could probably find the funniest part of Saturday Night Live or Jon Stewart or anything else on YouTube, like within 30 seconds, usually, or a few minutes of it actually showing up live. And those guys didn't make a dime on the advertising for that. And it, you know, it, it really threw them into a tizzy. And that, that has had a huge impact on, on the way they think about their business, the things they have done subsequently to try to increase the amount of digital commerce they engage in. Uh, and it's, it's had an enormous, you know, it's really affected an enormous change. The reason today that all of you can go on to Netflix and watch you know, any of 100,000 movies or Amazon or Apple TV or all the different places that you could go on, on the web and watch a movie, that only happened because the movie and television studios got so scared of things like YouTube that they started quickly moving around and doing deals and trying to get their content out to where people could start to pay for it online because they were terrified that everyone would get so used to getting movies and television for free that they would go bankrupt. Um, so it's had, a, it's, a, it's had a huge impact. But one of the things that they did in response to it that you may or may not be aware of, I don't know, has anyone ever heard of um, Content ID on YouTube? So every time you, today, every time you upload a video to YouTube, YouTube tapes, takes a, uh, a mathematical fingerprint of your video. Every, every piece of video, just like a hand, can be fingerprinted, sound can be fingerprinted, and it kind of is just a, a description, a selection of pixels and, and data about it, they take a fingerprint. And because they've been sued so many times by my member studios and folks like that, they compare every one of those fingerprints in, against a huge database of movies and TV that has been given to them by all the television broadcasters and movie studios. And if they find that the 30 second clip or the 10 minute clip or whatever it is, the fingerprints match, usually they will block the upload. And if you're uploading it, you'll get some sort of an error message and say this piece of content has been claimed by such and such a, a content owner. Uh, you know, you aren't allowed to post it unless you go through some process to prove that you're, you have permission and stuff like that. Um, and this is a, a technology that didn't exist seven, eight, nine years ago. It really just became proven and went into application over the last few years. and it. Most of the major consumer user-generated content sites where you upload either music or video today have one of these applications that fingerprints everything that goes up and tries to see if it's some sort of copyrighted material or not. It's not perfect. You know, it lets some things through. But it actually does a very reasonable job.